This is the OGM call, Open Global Mind, on Thursday, March 7th, 2024. I We've been a little bit out of sequence because I was MIA last week, and Ken, thank you very much for hosting last week. Um, and I think we're due for a check-in. So unless uh, somebody would like us to go in a different direction altogether, I was thinking we would start with a check-in and then see where that takes us. Um, and uh, I think we'll, uh, we know all, all of us are experienced here. Ah, no sound. That's not good. <sighs> Sorry, that was me. That's right. No, Ken. Ken's reporting in that he has no sound, so he's going to connect back in. There we go. So I'll wait to, for Ken to come back, and then we can jump into the the circle. Um, meanwhile, I'll say that as of Super Tuesday this week, it appears that the old duo is back as the candidates for this next election cycle, and it is all so strange. You're muted. Yeah. Careful about falling into the dominant narrative about old guys. It's true. It's true. Um, the diversion from the substance and uh, leads us to forget things like uh, that Nelson Mandela was in his upper 70s when he became president of South Africa and et cetera. I'm less concerned about old guys than I am about the status quo and the, the way this whole thing is played out. So, so yeah. yes. Plenty of concern to talk about. Yep. Yep. Um, no, it's just uh, so much to worry about. So little time. Hmm. <clears throat> um, come on, Ken. Join us back. Come back, Ken. Come back. There was a big article in several of the Dutch newspapers uh, today about the predicted third party candidates and the damage they could do, uh, mostly to Biden's campaign, as it was framed here. But there are also some who might uh, take votes away from Trump. Uh, do you see any or if hear any serious talk about third party campaigns these days? Yes, and, and very, yes, and very worrisome. The um the no labels party doesn't seem to have a candidate. They don't seem to have anything viable. Um, RFK Jr. Uh, seems to be getting a lot of money from strange people and have enough money and qualified in a couple of states where he might draw some votes away. That's kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a couple other small pieces. Nobody's as big as Ross Perot back when. Yeah, uh, he was a major major issue, right? In in, in the, that election. But can um, Kennedy could do some damage. Yeah. I had always hoped, always in the last half year, that Liz Cheney might become a third party candidate and channel lots of normal Republicans rather than MAGA Republicans away. But there's been no news about her in the media here in Europe. Um, I was hoping she and Mitt Romney and a couple other centrist Republicans would get together and actually do something substantive and respawn uh, a conservative party in this country that was normal. And that appears not to be on the agenda. Hey, Doug. <laughs> Sorry to catch you mid blow. <laughs> um, good. Uh, Ken has not made it back in. Go ahead, Gil. No, I was just saying, I was just observing that no, Ken. Yeah, no can, no can, no can. I'm observing uh, three, three, or maybe even four white beards of <laughs> plus Stacy. I know this is a interesting demographic pickle where we find ourselves in. We just haven't gotten Jerry to shave his head yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nor enjoy she, enjoy it she, while you have it. <laughs> Stacy hasn't shaved her head yet either. Uh, yeah. She said, point. and she's not gonna. And <laughs> thankfully, and thankfully, she doesn't have a beard. My hair's always been like pretty thin, but I'm, I'm surprised my hair is not my hair is not white. I'm just very surprised my hair is not white. So you're doing something right. The beard, the beard is white. The beard does come in white, but hey. 
Kevin, excellent. Kevin has joined. Um, uh, Kevin, we were sort of hanging out waiting, waiting for Ken to come back in because he had no sound. I have this funny feeling he's rebooting his computer or something like that. So we're just going to start in on a um, check-in round. Uh, I think we all know the, the ground rules for OGM check-in, so I won't worry about them. And I will go quiet for a little bit and see who would like to check in. Well, I've got something to check in about. It's kind of interesting. <clears throat> we set up this mashup between Impact Assets and uh, Eagle Market Streets, the CDC that we've done the fund for sole proprietors uh, becoming job creators with. And uh, basically, you can, it's flying off the shelves and we don't really even have it. It's kind of crazy. But we can make a, any nonprofit's existing donor base feel like more powerful givers and be more engaged. And uh, all these nonprofits want to meet with us and figure out how to do it because it's giving to invest. And they all and we can do it as low as five thousand dollars. So our innovation was to make it tiny and available to anybody. Uh, and you can do it, you know, from your civic club to something you care about or your Sunday school class or your eighth grade environmental science class. But what's crazy is that everybody who hears about it knows exactly what they want to do with it and they're going to go out and do it. So I'm hiring somebody who we're getting an FAQ together and we're doing a class on it on the 20th in person and on Zoom. And I'm hiring somebody who will go around to, you know, civic clubs and churches and nonprofits and explain it. And uh, so that's all. Kevin, yeah. can you explain? I'm just feeling a little dense. Can you explain traditional person donating nonprofit versus what you're doing for that contributor? Yeah. So in 50, with, in 50 words or less, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> well, usually, really usually yes. Usually you give the money and it's gone. In this, you give it and it comes back because it's gone out as a zero interest loan. A scenario I was talking to somebody about today is they need $10,000 in insulation to lower their monthly heating costs by $150. So we can take a cut of their heating cost and they can get $75. And probably what we're going to do as a standard is let you keep the money for the first year, whatever you're doing. It's either cutting deferred maintenance or it's a capital expenditure that's small that you can pay off with something. And it'll be, and then you get two years to, to pay it off, the 10000 that is purely that. Or it can be as low as five, obviously. And, um, but then it comes back when it's paid off into the individual account of an individual, there's a sub, you can get a sub account at Impact Assets, this three and a half billion dollar donor advice fund platform. And you, uh, so it comes back and it's your money to give with again. So you gave $250 and in, let's say this three year cycle, uh, in year two, it starts coming back to you. So you can, Give it again. You're more powerful. You're effortlessly more powerful. I think that's a feeling people will like. I think people will like feeling effortlessly more powerful. And and is there an intrinsic on on the initial give on the is it framed as a loan or is it framed as a yeah. contribution? It's no, framed as a loan. No. It is it is a loan that is expected to be paid back. Uh, they have a year to use it and then two years to pay it back. So there's there isn't the the tax deduction dimension. Yeah, this. you get a deduction when you open the DAF account at Impact Assets. Ah, After okay. that, 
it comes back into your little private family foundation I, that can I be as small as 250. But to go out, you need to partner with enough other people to get $5,000 out. So one thing that could happen is that an undifferentiated group of donors to, you know, uh, feeding program Y will become a coordinated giving circle that is evergreen. And so they're more engaged because they feel it when the money comes back. And they can decide to keep it and, you know, give to some other nonprofit. The money can't go back in their pocket. Or they could recycle the money at this thing, group that they already care for. So it works for groups who care, who give. And it makes them more powerful givers. Um, since we're already <clears throat> already breaking the rules of check-in, sorry, I'm, I'm, that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to break them a little bit more because Kevin, I think we're really interested in what you're saying. Um, uh, maybe two questions from me, Kevin. One is, um, I've seen, I've heard you name this many different sorts of things. Does it have one name you really love that we can kind of address it as? Because I've heard watershed fund and a bunch of other kinds of things. Yeah, the fund <laughs> would use it. It is, it is right now the mashup between Eagle Market Streets and Impact Assets. It needs a better name than that. Uh, okay. You know, it's, it's the give to invest platform. That's so probably the... So it needs, a, it needs a, a good name. And then what you're describing is very similar to microfinance where um, loans are repaid. And then, the, the, you know, like with Kiva, the loan circles back into somebody else's loan, which is terrific. It's just that this, yeah. these, these are larger loans. These are smaller <laughs> loans. The idea oh, okay. is it can go out at five thousand dollars. Well, five thousand dollars is larger than Kiva. Kiva, Kiva's is, like is by a cow. Yeah. 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 Well, the problem with Kiva uh, is that you, you need twenty five friends with twenty five dollars to get up on the Kiva platform. So, with the accelerators that I work with, not one entrepreneur in either Mortar or Optima Business Bootcamp in Oakland with, had twenty five friends with twenty five dollars. So Kiva is actually an exclusive platform mm -hmm. you need friends and family with money you mean to be uh to accept donations on kiva to yes to to put your project up there you need 25 friends with 25 dollars i was working with two different uh, minority-led accelerators and not one of them had one entrepreneur with 25 friends with 25 dollars wow so it's the friends and family gap. That's why I've been working in the friends and family gap for about a decade because of that fact. Yeah. Uh, and and so this, you get a deduction going in with Kiva. Uh, I, I think it comes back to you and you get to decide this goes into your donor advised fund account. So it stays in the giving world. Um. Why don't we proceed with check-in and we can come back to this if we want to um, at the end of check-in round. But thank, thanks, Kevin. Thanks for the explanation. Yeah. yeah. Is that clear enough? I think so. Got it. Okay, Got great. It. Thanks. Well, I can uh, do a check-in, although it's uh, 
uh, very different than uh, than yours, Kevin. Uh, uh, you are working with practical things to help people have a more uh, uh, a better quality life, and I'm working with perhaps more uh, conceptual, intellectual things. Uh, before I start off with my story, I'll say I'm only going to be in today for about an hour because uh, it's it'll be six o'clock or quarter past six when I leave and I want to be on the democracy call after that. And I'll also say I haven't been here for the last uh, two weeks because I was uh, in Iceland at the uh, rethinking democracy conference, uh, uh, but that's about democracy. So I'll perhaps save that for the next call. And last week I had two visitors from New York who stayed uh, five days with us, and that leads me into what's on top of my attention at the moment. It's about how you create knowledge and meaning and understanding. Uh, in conversations, uh, the importance of the language you use, the importance of the place a conversation uh, is held. Uh, and that relates very much to the Japanese concept of ba, B-A, uh, which I usually translate as a shared context. And uh, other people might say it's a moment of time and space, which is given meaning by people. Uh, and I've had two workshops uh, about it in the last couple of days. Uh, but the reason that's really top of attention is that uh, on last Thursday evening, uh, a very remarkable conversation took place between my two visitors and myself. Uh, the the guy, the fellow is uh, a cousin of mine from New York and his partner is a, is a woman who runs a very uh, special art gallery in New York. And uh, we had a conversation lasting almost three hours with a remarkable clarity and a remarkable degree of trying to co-create knowledge about questions like what's the language we need to understand the physical universe. Uh, my cousin is a theoretical uh, a physicist. What language do we need to understand what makes one work of art a timeless masterpiece and thousands of others just something that you see and perhaps walk by. And we went at it in such a way that it seemed that we were not talking with each other, but we were talking with the space of the conversation, uh, a physical space, a, a mental space, an, an affective space, uh, and nothing would be contradicted. It was totally in the spirit of yes and, even when each person might have said, I don't understand that at all. That was part of the conversation. And after three hours, my wife came home from uh, her, uh, her bridge lessons and she felt what was going on. And when we wanted to invite her into the conversation, she said, no, let me just uh, listen and do my own thing in the corner of the room. And it went on another half an hour until the moment was right. And as we might say, the ba of the space invited her in. And when she was in the conversation, it went on again for another hour. And it was such a powerful experience, which I'm still trying to understand. Hmm. Uh, I know a lot about Ba. I've been using the concept for almost 15 years. And although it's a Japanese concept, I've even given presentations about it in Japan. But it's something that you have to feel with your body and grasp 
with your mind and well, my hands go out and they're open for other ideas. Uh, and one last thought about this, uh, the Japanese visiting professor of, of knowledge, science, and collective creativity, who I did workshops with, uh, feels that Ba can only be created uh, in physical co-presence and not online. And I've had many many experiences of of having a ba online a lot of them being experiences for example in ogm calls uh so she and i are going to be in contact uh, online obviously when she goes back to japan and when she comes back in the autumn we're probably going to give a kind of workshop about uh it, whether it's possible to experience the same ba in physical co-presence with people or uh, and online with the same people. I've got a lot more to say about it, but I'll leave it for that at the moment. I'll, I'll check in now that I have my computer back up after after dropping something on my ankle. I'm in a little bit of pain now, but anyway. Um, so this, I was also away last week. I was at Kevin's Neighborhood um, Economics Conference. And one of the things that really stood out for me is that there was that bar there. I didn't have the words to use to explain that. And I kept explaining to people that the energy was different because there were a large concentration of people, in my opinion, that truly were there to see how they could elevate others, as opposed to lots of conferences where people are going, what opportunity can I find for myself? And I personally think that that's what the difference was. There was a certain resonance there. And I'll just mention, because you brought up language, there was a thoracic surgeon on the panel who actually said before she didn't have the language. So she was seeing what she was seeing that pertained, but she couldn't communicate with the different groups because the language wasn't there. And um, yeah, I thought it, it was a fabulous conference. It really was. Um, and I, I guess Kevin spoke a little bit about it while I was mm -hmm. trying to fix things. So that's my check-in. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I've been I've been thinking a lot about recurrence and emergence lately, um, um, and I've heard it in in a lot of the conversations of our ilk in various forms. Seem to be focused a lot on emergence. How does the new emerge? And I realize that we also <clears throat> we depend a lot on recurrence, on stability, on things that are repeatable and reliable. Um, so I'm thinking about that a lot in general, uh, in the in in the context of the process of of of, of transformation, um, and also in very practical terms in my own life, um, and um, uh, experimenting with with what with creating more structure and rigor um, uh, in my practices as a way to allow the emergent to emerge. So very to to, to concrete cases in point. 
<clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm now um, in 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 the spirit of the flow guys, um, wake, waking up, getting out of bed, and hitting the keyboard to do my to do my the creative writing that I never get to do on a normal busy day. Um, and a few days ago, I thought, wait a minute, people. I, I know professional writers who have have a words per day target. So let me add a words per day target. And I thought, you know, if, I know people would do two thousand, which is beyond my reach. I thought two hundred. I thought, no, let me just start with a hundred. And so for the last three days, I've written at least 100 words a day, the first thing in the morning. And it's cool, you know, and it's a it's a recurrent structure that's allowing for emergence. So that's sort of one piece of it. Um, um, I've observed in my business activities, you all know that I'm doing a lot of one on one coaching. And I uh, came to the assessment recently that I'm doing it as an activity, not like a business. Um, and if I ran it like a business with the expected recurrence of, you know, structures, activities, results on some kind of steady pace, something interesting might happen. Uh, so I'm um, moving into that, uh, noticing resistance. Um, I woke up this morning realizing that it's time to reread uh, The War of Art, brilliant book by Stephen Pressfield um, about creative process where Pressfield identifies resistance not just as a, a, a mood or an attitude, but as a force in the world that is designed to kill you, that is there looming over your shoulder all the time, ready to smack you down. And a, and a creative person needs to be able to recognize and deal with that. So that's alive for me right now. Um, uh, really interesting book I highly recommend. Um, um, and... Um, other thing very much on my mind, and I imagine this would be a topic in the in the democracy call, is um, I find myself being pulled away from my grand theoretical concerns to the very practical matter of how do we prevent the MAGA sweep in November. Uh, so um, so we can talk about that more in the next hour. Um, and and last but not least. Um, uh, I think most of you've heard, most of you have heard me talk about Fernando Flores, um, um, philosopher, entrepreneur, politician, um, mentor of mine for the last ten years. Um, Fernando is launching his last year of training programs um, this afternoon. Uh, if any of you are interested in knowing more about that, give me you know ping me in the chat, and I can tell you more about that. Three to five today Pacific time. You're all invited as my guests, um, and if you know other people who might be interested. Uh, this is a, a deep, uh, ontologically grounded, language-based approach to being and change in the world. And uh, in my experience, it's been enormously powerful uh, for me. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the uh, it, that's the 2021 details. I, I will I can post in the chat a PDF of the current program, which I'll do afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, he's got an update for 2023-24, I think. Yeah. Not for the faint of wallet. Yep. Not for the, um, I don't know if that's the current price. And um, as with everything in the world, there are, you can make requests and offers. Um, uh, not to diverge too much, but I was invited into his last program, which was $18,000. And uh, I said, I can't afford that. What can you afford? I put a fourth on offer. They said, we don't have a match. So, um, and that was after, after the, yeah, that's after being told I could be a teaching assistant. And I've since found out three people that I know are being teaching assistants at no cost. So I'm a little miffed about that, honestly. Okay, got it. Um, and, and what I said still stands. I don't know what happened, Ken. I wish I'd known. I'll, I'll follow on. Um, I had a really interesting phone call with, uh, or, or a Zoom call with Jordan uh, Sukut the other day. I was saying that right, Sukut? Sukut? Yes. So, yeah. Um, he had mentioned on a call uh, that he had done this large scale infrastructure work and, you know, he's working with all these different entities. And I said, Oh, I really want to talk to you about collaboration. And, you know, he's worked on dams and skyscrapers and, and he was telling me um, the most 
dangerous part of the project is when you're digging in the earth. Once you reach the ground level and you start building upwards, it's way easier. But when you're in the earth, you don't know what you're going to find. Different substrates, water, you know, fault lines, all these things. And, and I just, I thought that what a marvelous metaphor that when we're trying to bring together our unconscious to build a foundation on which we can, to reach a foundation from which we can build upwards, that's the most dangerous part. That's when it's fraught with someone's going to say something and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that. Or, oh, how can you think that way? And it just really struck me as a, as a beautiful metaphor. And that's what I talked about plans and how, you know, he would make all these plans and plans never, ever work the way you think they're going to. And in the business world, everything's about plans. They say, you know, failure to plan is, is, is uh, planning to fail. And his take on it is that the plan is there as a guide to teach you what you need to know. So when the plan doesn't work, you don't go, oh, the plan's not working. We have to we have to figure out how to make the plan work. You say, the plan just taught us something new that we need to now incorporate so that we're in a curiosity and learning mode. And again, I just was like, this is as someone who works a lot on, uh, yeah, planning is invaluable. As someone who works a lot on, on collaboration, this is a great reframing um, for me. And um, so that's that's just been on my mind a little bit the last couple of days. Also thinking a lot about um, soul. Gil and I did a call last month for Living Between Worlds where, you know, we started off with this idea of Tikkun Malone, which in Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, he said it's the repair of the world's soul through your soul sight. And um, for me, soul is what connects me to the earth. And uh, as I as I look at what's going on in the world, you know, I'm I'm very cognizant of the fact that most modern and or most moderns to it's the wrong word because modernity is hundreds of years old. So the most contemporary peoples um, have no initiation experience of actually being connected to the earth. Uh, indigenous peoples, you know, you go through some harrowing experiences that let you know you're nothing in the in the face of the universe, and yet you're something. And you know, the, there's a, there's a great deal of fear that comes up in initiation initiation and when i went through my initiation i was scared shitless so um i think we're headed for some big cultural initiations where there's going to be tremendous fear where there's going to be um uh things that are going to force people to reckon to to deal with um with things they they don't want to have in their consciousness right now and uh we'll need some kind of um emotional infrastructure and cultural infrastructure to deal with that that seems to be missing so uh there's a lot of talk on these calls about you know uh, being a world changer and and finding our way to uh strengthen and the resilience um and it often focuses on technology and and um uh processes but it, it rarely comes down to what's the emotional infrastructure what's the cultural infrastructure for dealing with um the stuff that we're going to have to deal with. So that's a big question in my mind right now. Um, so that's where I am. Thank you. Um, I'll check in. Many things on my mind, one of which is the junket that I just came back from in Bahrain, which I talked about at the top of the call, uh, which had me thinking about why people do what and influence and how do you how do you polish reputations? Because it, the best I could figure is the cause of this event was PMI, Philip Morris International, had some marketing spend and has a long-standing sponsorship with Scuderia Ferrari, 
which is one of the auto teams for the Formula One. And so that's how I ended up going to Bahrain is that I think uh, they're, they're sort of the money and the reason behind the whole thing. But I, so much of the, the event didn't really pencil out in some sense. And I'm, I'm still puzzled about that. Then we've got the governance call coming up uh, at, the, at, at 10. And Gil, you had written, and I meant to reply to your note to, to the list, you had written that we should really just worry about how to put out the fires to make sure MAGA doesn't sweep the next election. And I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. I, I, I certainly think that that's an, an emergency, and I think we'll talk about that in the next call. Um, but I think one of the reasons we're in such a crisis is that we're completely missing an actual rethink and reconnection, a, a healing of the of the tikkun olam type that Ken was just talking about. We're, we're sort of missing that entirely. So tactical attempts to stave off the calamity are just worsening the calamity in some sense. Is the feeling I have, and and I I would love to find a middle way or some other sort of thing. But but to me the uh, one of my new friends who's more conservative than me he says look. If polls tell us that most Americans agree with progressive positions on abortion and on a bunch of other things, then why aren't the Democrats just running the table everywhere? Why aren't they large and in charge with majorities everywhere? Why is this even a contest with Trump, et cetera, et cetera? They're not running the table because there's something badly broken, seriously badly broken. And my amateur attempt to sort of um, circle around and see if we can't think about governance and and sort of put some structure to it. Some I don't think structure is the right word to it. Uh, somehow uh, is a, is an attempt to say there's something fundamental we need to figure out about how the whole process works and how we're collaborating to make a better world. And it's not it ain't working right now. And a piece of the protest, a piece of the reason there's a fire on the on the crisis clinic as it washes over the waterfall is um, that we're not recognizing those parts of it. So I think it's a, there's a there's a fun conversation there about not very fun issues, but um, I'm looking forward to that. And then um, I keep coming back to how do you explain how to be in the world as the future unfolds in this sort of weird, clumsy, sometimes dangerous and scary way? And how to be in it in a way that um, improves the world as we go through it. Um, uh, years ago, uh, for fun, I bought the domain upketo.com because my sport is Aikido. And I thought, what if you combine the concept of uplift or upward spiral with the notions of Aikido and turn that into a fun martial art or something like that? And you know, Aikido is a practice where everything you touch is improved by your presence, or at least that's your intention because it's really, it's often really easy to think you have good intentions and still screw things up royally. But that's the, the the general goal of it. And I think one of the one of the topics to address in thinking about up keto is what what would it take to actually do that? And I I think there's lots of interesting conversations to be held there. Um, yeah, Ken found the crisis clinic, the Lar the Gary Larson cartoon, which is the thing I was actually exactly pointing to. Um, so that's all in my mind because there's. Um, we're on we're in that crisis clinic right now it feels like uh and weirdly the crisis we're trying to stave off is not in fact the set of crises that we should be collaborating to in, to to avoid or 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 change which might involve climate change might involve uh caste crises and, and a whole bunch of other things we're trying to we're trying to avoid an electoral crisis and other things around voting and democracy when in fact we need to focus on other sorts of things. So um, that's a lot of stuff all at once, but um, thank you for that.
So I guess I'll I'll bring up the tale. Um, so I'm I'm sort of a, a little bit of a straddle between Hank's share um, and Jerry, what you're raising, which is like what might be a different angle of attack <laughs> or orientation. Um, and so I'm um, finding myself <clears throat> much more focused on, I guess, uh, Hank's Ba construct, which I'm not familiar, had, had not heard, but I'm living in more and more frequently uh, in more and more diverse sort of interactions, collaborations and other. And the feeling sensing into connection and understanding without any attachments, without any, um, without any of me being the the live in, the sort of center concern or orientation, but just sort of feeling sensing into what's the it in the center. And and there's somebody in this community that that you know we've had a, a weekly coffee clutch now for going on a year. And I'd say nine months in, we got to a place of um, transcending attachments, the egos, the, <clears throat> the um, old forms. Um, came to a separate piece about language where there were things that were said one way by one and one way by another, but we're pointing at the same thing. And We're just now establishing a kind of flow that really enables seeing where the differences are in positioning and context and orientation, not in an oppositional way, not in a in a um, power power. Uh, afflicted way where both of us are focused in the same sort of center of gravity from a from a fire and, and water standpoint you know what gets us up in the morning and why we're focused where we're focused and spending our time and attention what we're spending it on um but recognizing sort of the difference of the pull that he has to be doing what he's doing and that I'm experiencing and what I'm sort of focusing on. They're parts of the same whole, if that makes sense. But there are subtle differences in orientation. And... And yesterday we had a conversation where um, we surfaced the differences, but I, you know, I said to him, I said, I really think um, I'm a, I'm sort of a pre-stepper. You're actually looking to energize and stand up a collaborative ecosystem, like a thing. You're looking to birth something, bring something into manifestation. And I'm more centered on, contextualizing the thing you're birthing. Getting the story together as a way of in service to and in, in, in help of the constituent elements in the thing you're looking to cohere um, and, and, uh, and bring into existence. And, and it was completely complimentary it was completely generative 
It was completely out of emergence in that moment. There wasn't any bringing a whole rear view mirror in or projecting a whole future anything in. It was in the moment of. And the difference of that energetically and experientially, subjectively, you know, um, was just completely different. Like in this, in a whole being embodied way, in a mental body way, in an energetic body way, it was just a very different. And the sensation was of being balanced across all of those elements, all those energies. Um, so being one and being different at the same time. And to get there, the biggest single thing for me experientially was um, shedding attachments and shedding constructs and shedding nouns, like really getting out of the noun game and getting out of the intellectual abstraction, academic, scientific, blah, 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 game, like really... Um, putting all that stuff aside doesn't mean it's dismissed or discarded. It means it's um, present, but not required, <laughs> like not needed in the moment of getting to that sharing and that understanding. So with that, I'm complete. I don't know whether any of that made any sense or was even remotely comprehensible because it's sort of, not a thing of language that I'm trying to describe, but anyway, for what it's worth. Stacy's got a question for you. And Stacy, you're muted. Not not a question, but I think everybody's checked in, and I just want to add on. To, so when Doug said being one and being different, to me, it attached Jerry to what you were saying because when you were talking about a keto, and this might not. What came to mind is like when you're doing something on the computer, how you make a copy of it and you leave that original there and then you take the copy and you change it. Um, because I, I, I think it's... Uh oh, Stacey, we're losing your connection. Uh, Ken, you're muted. <laughs> Stacy, try turning off your camera. Example, like Gil made a, a point about resistance. Stacy, yeah, we missed almost everything you said. Can you turn off your video? I know, and oh. you were el you were eloquent and right on it, and you you froze like this. We lost you. We lost you entirely. So if you kill your video, it's likely that the audio will go through uh, pretty well. Or just put it to sleep. Try again. Not Instead working. of killing your video, just put it asleep. Go ahead. <laughs> so you didn't hear anything at all? We heard the start of what you said. And right as Zoom will do, right as you really launched into it, you froze. Okay. Let's see if I can remember. I know that Doug had said about being one and being different. And I was trying to say how, Jerry, when you were speaking about the Aikido part, the what was flashing in my head was this idea of when I'm doing something on the computer before I change something I make a copy of the original mm -hmm. and how important that was and then I went on to say that it's very easy to see two sides when they're totally opposite but when they're like the same but different it's harder to see those other sides without feeling like you're negating one or that one is better. They're just different conversations. So as an example, Gil was talking about resistance. But then when Ken talked about his conversation with Jordan, he brought up another time of resistance. And sometimes that resistance is there to stop you for a good reason. So even to like that's just the example that's coming to mind now. 
but um, there are, yeah, I, I'm going to stop now because it's I'm all frazzled with the camera and whatnot. But I think that there are definitely some conversations to be had about things that seem the same and acknowledging the different pieces because it not that it changes the conversation, but they complement each other. And if you don't separate it, then you just get like a mushmash of everything instead of like if you think about the yin yang symbol, if you just mix the black and white, you'd have nothing. <laughs> like you have to sort of let things reorganize for the right time and the right conversation. I'm sorry, I don't have better words to explain what I'm trying to say. Um, Stacey, that was good. And thank you for diving back in and giving it another go. Um, anyone want to comment back? Doug is nodding, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if you want to come back in. You're, you're muted, Doug. Yeah, the the um, Stacy, you sort of nailed it. Um, if the underlying premise, if the underlying context is that we're not a, we're not in resonance alignment and part of the same whole. The opposite of that is we're in contention, we're in disconnection, we're in adversarialness to greater or lesser degrees. If the underlying major premise is we're all connected, we're all in the same boat, headed in the same direction, good, bad, or indifferent, um, as that extrapolates down into the details and the weeds and the shrubs, um, the fundamental underlying contextual premise difference in that changes everything. It literally changes everything because <clears throat> I'm coming with excitement and curiosity, interest and energy, I'm not coming with my fists up trying to win <laughs> or survive or whatever the the polar version is. And um, how to how to catalyze a reawakening on a felt sense level of what I see in you that I see in me and vice versa seems to me the, the sort of critical difference and shift and, and intrinsic opportunity in every moment between whatever factions and people there are. Recognition and, and, and uh, acknowledgement of I'm, your, I'm you, you're me. Like whatever the it is in the center, let's figure it out. And I have been accused of all sorts of naivetes and delusions and some, being a simpleton and all of that for saying that kind of thing many times over my life. But the bottom line is I still stand by it. <laughs> yeah, I'm complete. Thanks, Doug. Um, I just want to draw a piece of what I think you're talking about and see if I can take it in a direction that that's fruitful here. Hey, Scott, we've finished our check-ins. If you'd like to check in, you're welcome to do so, but we're sort of off talking about what came up during the check-in round. I, um, I, I will have one when when it fits. Excellent. Good. I will I will pause in a second and you can check in. Um, I mean, I've, I've hit a bunch of initiatives recently that are trying to create more civil discourse or whatever else. And often the language that they use is language that I'm pretty sure from my naive outsider's role, that people on the right that are trying to destroy discourse are simply going to laugh at and not accept and not step into. They just, no, like, it, it, you know, if you start with inclusivity and, diverg and, and uh, diversity and stuff like that, they're like, yeah, sure, whatever. These, these, are, these are trigger words that, that cause them to pull the ripcord early and go. 
because not that, that that's not whatever. Then I think it was in the last OGM call or something like that. Um, Gil, was it you who told the story of uh, the, the Aikido story about the man on the subway? I think it was. Yes. And so uh, you're muted. So we're having muteitis today. Really bad case of muteitis. Everybody's like forgetting to unmute. I'm trying to keep from seizing the camera when other people are talking. Uh, I shared the story and uh, several of us shared different versions of it. Yep. Yep. Cool. Uh, and briefly, for those who missed it, a uh, drunken man who looks a little dangerous gets on a subway car or a rail car, uh, threatens a woman uh, from the back of the of the car. Uh, oh, and sorry. And uh, Aikido guy who's rising in the ranks is in the car, like kind of eager to practice his Aikido. Uh, and then just as he's about to go try to neutralize the drunken guy, a voice comes from the back of the car and says, hey, uh, what kind of sake? What, what have you been drinking? And, and the guy says, sake. Oh, my wife and I like sake. And they start talking. And at the little, end of the tiny, tiny little old man. Doing yeah. This. And by the end of the ride, uh, the, the, the drunken guy is sort of crying, uh, you know, under the arm of the, the tiny little old guy. And, and Aikido master... Uh, realizes where the uh, real Aikido was practiced that day on the subway train. It was the old man who said, hey, what are you, what you've been drinking? Which was a point of commonality, right? For, for me, the thing that leaps out of that story is that the opening gesture, the opening salvo is one of connection and commonality. It's like, hey, you, you, uh, we can both tell you've been drinking. What do you like to drink? And, you know, wife and I also like our sake and let's get talking. And, and that's that's uh, an opening gesture that is is hard to refuse in some sense. That makes a lot of sense. That walks in at the right level. I don't know. There's a bunch of different ways of, to say it. Um, and so I'm I'm concerned that there's a bunch of earnest people with really interesting frameworks, great frameworks that are framed in language that will not bridge that divide, that will not cross the chasm, that won't get won't get there. And a bunch of people trying to prove facts or do whatever else when a lot of the story is emotion and membership and loyalty and faith. Uh, there's just so many angles to this. And it worry, that worries me about discourse in general as we walk into this dicey uh, eight months left until November or whatever the math is, because we're already in three. Damn it, five months left? Are you serious? Six months? Ah, oh, this sucks. Go ahead, Gil. So I have an invitation, Jerry. Um, let's all take a deep breath. And let's all take another breath. And then, Jerry, could you just very quickly just spin a tale, just spin a fable, spin a story like the, like the Japanese subway story about the uh, political cultural conflict in America that you just described. What would that look like if it looked like the Japanese subway story? Um, well, I've been trying to spin sub pieces of that fable for a while well, since Trump started campaigning in 2015 into 2016. And a piece but of that, it, well, just, well, I, I, just, uh, I, I right into it. Don't tell us about it. Just tell me a story right now. Okay. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to come up with a story that doesn't sound like a trope or like a you know a, a, yeah, so, a so don't try to come up with just start speaking. Okay. Uh, Doug has a, a thought. Uh, I, I have a really small one. So my wife and I are in Home Depot. We're in the garden section. <clears throat> and there's an old guy and he's clearly really hurting and we sort of caught his eye and he caught our eye and he was wearing a MAGA hat. And, and I asked him, how are you doing? And he was like, well, I just had a gallbladder surgery. Ooh. And my wife is down a gallbladder. She was like, I know what that's like. <laughs> and we were connected and we had a nice conversation and we had recognition of each other and the MAGA hat part of him never came up and 
you know, uh, the the domains of difference were as big as the Grand Canyon on a, on a, on many dimensions. However, uh, we all got gallbladders, <laughs> and, some, and we some of us and we one, one down, but yeah. some of us one down, and we've all been on the back end of some surgical procedure and know how much that sucks when you're trying to get back to lit lifing. So that's my example. And unfortunately, I have to hop, but I really love this and appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Doug. And I'm asking the question more metaphorically. Because mm -hmm. uh, one-on-one, -on -one, um, it's understandable. I've had that experience. I've, you know, I, I became dear friends with a Trump voter some years ago. Uh, in you know in 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 energetically similar way to what Doug was talking about, um, and one to one I can see it, and you know living room dialogues, you know a few people together I can see it, but metaphorically, what's the subway story for America now? So the, it's not, so it's not Ken's cartoon, but yeah, something yeah. more transformative than that. I'm, I'm this this is a serious and open and curious question. I don't have oh, a... I appreciate it. I, I, there's a piece of me that immediately jumps to an apology, which is like, hey, America, we're really sorry we fucked up a lot in the last couple decades. And we'd like to listen and make amends and figure stuff out together. Like not ignoring you, not bypassing you, not whatever else. Um... But that's kind of that's kind of where where my mind goes to. Mm. Go ahead, Stacey. It looks like you want to jump in. Oh. <laughs> I was just kind of breathing, but yes, I'll, oh. I will jump. But I but I will because to me it's more there are people that are very emotional that get offended very easily on all sides and everywhere. And to me, it's about separating them out and moving towards the middle and finding those people to have the conversations with, regardless of what side. Um, I accident, I'm embarrassed to say this because I always am judgmental about people that watch reality television, but I accidentally found my way to a reality TV show that was about trust. So mm. I could not resist. It was fascinating. But what's clear, what was fascinating for me, because I was able to predict what everybody was going to do. So that was a lot of fun. But I even I, I did catch myself once when I saw one of the women showing compassion for another woman that was driving me crazy when she recognized why she exhibited such what I just call nastiness. Mm -hmm. um, but the point the point I want to make is that most people are not good at seeing complexity, and that includes complexity in other people. And I don't see any way to, to pull everybody into a conversation where that skill is required. So for me, the best thing to do is try to find the people closest to the center, to move even closer. And what I mean by the center is away from the emotion and more to the logic. So when I see people that say, like I just did this, somebody somebody was talking and somebody gave an answer and then the person said, that's so rude, I'm blocking you. And I said, what did she say that was rude? And then other people came in and said, yeah, what are you talking about? We have to call those people out because too many people will listen to other people and say, oh yeah, that person is rude, I heard that. Who'd you hear it from? You know, and in this particular show, the sad thing for me is that somebody who later be called the was called the angel in the group, she was voted off first. And why? Because somebody else who reacted emotionally to her saying something very honest and standing up for somebody else didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So, again, we have to divide the people that are not able to think logically and are too emotional. And that's not women and that's not men. It's mm -hmm. just, you know. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Scott, please. Uh, 
Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'll save my check-in thing for perhaps a little later. Um, so something, a, a reframing, which I know we all love. Yeah. It's one of our favorites. So something that uh, struck me and has continued to strike me, it was a couple of years ago, I learned, I was introduced to the Big Five personality model, which appears to be the most robustly studied personality model that's actually one that was not. All right, thank you, Ken. So there's a little, a little support for that. I'm not saying it's the end all be all, but what was most interesting to me about this was I had heard that there is a correlation between two dimensions and political alignment. And what the, the, the correlations were high orderliness predicts conservatism, conservatism, yeah, easy for you to say. Orderliness is a uh, subset of conscientiousness, mm -hmm. so, so which is one of the big five. And high openness correlates with liberalism. And the way that this was was introduced to me was how many walls should there be between things? How many walls should there be between things? On the high openness side, there shouldn't be any walls. There should be a free exchange across ideas, countries, people, groups, whatever. Any category should be, should have permeable barriers. On the high orderliness side, it's the opposite. Bring on the walls. We want clear divisions between our categories. There's no gray between A and B. And the interesting thing about it is that in certain situations, it is going to be better for all of us if we are more one way, more open. We have the permeability. We have the sharing of ideas. We have. And in other ways, other times, it's going to be better if we have high orderliness. We have less sharing across boundaries. Let's talk about COVID for a little bit. We don't want to be sharing everything all the time. And the problem is that we don't know which is best in which situation, which is why we need to be able to communicate with each other and say, I think we should have more walls in this situation. I think we should have less walls in this situation. All right, well, let's discuss this. But the reason I bring this up is that a lot of the comments that I hear in this group, my, my knee-jerk reaction is, oh, well, that's someone who's high in orderliness. And you're not going to convince them because per personalities have found to be fairly stable over across time. They might change over many, many decades or a lifetime. As we become older, we generally become more open, you know, but things things happen like that. Anyway, that my point being is that um there's a divide there that is fundamental in the nature of how we perceive the world. We actually see it as if this is better or this is better. And it doesn't have anything to do with who your leaders are or any of that stuff. It's just fundamentally which one I think is is more the way we should be. And obviously, it's a bell curve. It's a distribution. And so that's been something that's super helpful for me as a framework to help see why it's difficult to talk. Because someone who is saying the border should be open is going to have a difficult time convincing someone who thinks that the border should be closed. For, for reasons that are so fundamental that they're they're much deeper than politics. So anyway, that was my uh, that was my thought there. Thanks, Scott. Um, Jill. <clears throat> Scott, I'm intrigued by what you've said. Uh, I'm not familiar with the big five model. I'll check that out later. Uh, but I'm I'm intrigued and perplexed, I guess. So um, um, you're speaking of these as though they are fixed categories, 
uh, that people don't change. You're saying they're fundamental and don't change, but yet you're saying also that as people become older, they become more open. Well, the common wisdom is that as people become older, they become more conservative. So there's all that. Very, very quickly, it's in a, in the space of a conversation, okay, such as Stacy's describing, or several weeks, you're yeah. not going to have that kind of movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, I'm I I I, I I'm I'm going to follow these links and poke into that a little bit more. But I, as I as I listen to you talk about uh, you know one side wanting, it's not like how many walls, so like walls or no walls. So you know some folks want walls, some folks don't want walls. But it strikes me that one of the most fundamental organizing principles of living systems is semi permeable membranes, neither fully open nor fully closed. Uh, but open to some things and open to some things some of the time, you know, like, you know, membranes that cast certain things and block certain things, but also will change their permeability under certain conditions. Uh, and that model uh, is very vivid for me as a way, you know, both in general and as a way to, to hear what you're saying. So I'd love to see how those things intersect. As I had mentioned, the big five, one of the interesting things is that each one of the dimensions is on a bell curve. So there's high ordering linear snow at distributed across populations. So again, most of the people are going to be in the semi-permeable, um, you know, based on their on, on that distribution. And but, did you say and did you say that this is the the best or one of the best of the personality models? And if so, it is what... the most robustly studied and and validated. Real science and, behind it, not MBTI made up by somebody who didn't know what the hell they were talking about. You, you'll it, it's statistically derived. It's linguistic based, which you might have, uh, depending on how you're how you think about it, you might have an issue with. But um, I found it to be huh. very interesting in that both sides of each of the five dimensions have. Um, evolutionary utility yeah which is gotcha. why they both exist yeah gotcha uh, and is ocean and canoe are those acronyms of the big five correct gotcha. thank you guys and then from my brain cambridge analytica used ocean to target voters back in 2016 yeah so back so, to your earlier question jerry is why aren't the dems using it I'm not so much asking why aren't the Dems using Ocean uh, no. to, to do this analysis. I'm sort of saying why we're missing something fundamental about how humans cooperate to make decisions. If you if you address why this will protect your boundaries and which boundaries are important to keep, you might create a bridge. If you if you acknowledge that instead of trying to say tear down the walls. You're saying, here's, here's how these walls are serving us. Here's how they might not be serving us, which is us bringing the openness side into the conversation in a way that can be understood potentially. And, and again, I think Gil, you identified this already that, uh, but you didn't use the word. So a category would be a wall. Because any category is a boundary between included and not included. And so, you know, it's it's real, it's conceptual, it, it's, and anyway, so for the last three years or so since I've known about the big five, I've seen it play out and it, and I've never yet heard anyone talk about that, the way that those two correlate with conservatism and liberalism, so. Um, and then back to Scott for a check-in, if you'd like. Okay, so the reason I jumped on today a little bit late was that I, I had something happen. And it, uh, Jerry, you've talked about before about dipping your, you know, ladle in the stream of information and, and things like that. And I had a very visceral experience that made it, uh, I don't know, I thought it was really interesting. So as a Christmas present to myself, or no, birthday present, I bought a new camera, which looks like an old camera, which is why I bought it. it. Looks like a camera that I had 40 years ago. And it's just wonderful because it's brand new technology, except it 
It has the old aesthetic. It has all these wonderful dials and knobs, and it's it very. Does. It's got knobs and gears and shit. Touchy, yeah, it's very touchy, and I, I like all of that. And it's it's a a refocusing on the aesthetic. I just instead of taking pictures with my phone, I want to take, I want to take a, I want to make photographs. I want to see the world photographically. I want to walk outside and say, "Oh, isn't that lovely?" Instead of walking outside, getting in my car and driving away. All right. So at the same time. I also got a pair of binoculars. And these are much more powerful than the lens on my camera. They can really, I, mean, I can watch a little squirrel from out my window. And what happened this morning was that I saw a little squirrel. And I grabbed, I, I stood there and I thought, okay. And I went to my little office and I wasn't sure which to grab. So do I grab the binoculars? Now the binoculars are going to pull me in. And I'm going to get to see, you know, you know, you know, this little squirrel really close. I can see the little furs and it's just wonderful. But it's gone. All I'm doing is, is dipping my ladle in. I get to see it. I don't get to remember it. I get to kind of remember what my impressions of, you know, my impressions were of that. But it's it's absolutely fleeting. You know, it. Lots of detail, but it's gone. And then with the camera, I can take a photograph, but I'm I'm further away. It's more of a representation. Um, but I can I can view it later. I can revisit it later. As you know, and I'll remember that, oh yeah, it's maybe I won't remember that actually there's all this detail that I couldn't see because I used a camera instead of binoculars, you know, and and it's it was just a really instantaneous reminder of all the notes I take and all the things I collect and my memories of conversations and all those things kind of split into, well, I can sit there and take photos of it and I can take notes of it. And that's my camera, low resolution, but captured for later, or I can be fully present in great detail, but it's effervescent, as you said, evan evanescent. evanescent. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Effervescent depends on the squirrel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I wanted to share that because it was just such a, it seems like it's been a theme as we go through is how to capture, how to capture a conversation, how to capture a moment. And in that moment, I thought, you know what? I'm not sure I, I can. I can capture a low resolution version or I can fully experience it, but I can't do both. I can't do both. I had to pick binoculars or camera. Mm -hmm. So that's my check-in. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks, Scott. I'm going to go back to the earlier part of the conversation. Um, I'm a little uh, feeling a little contrary today and a little cynical. Um, three things have come to my attention in the last uh, last few days. One, I watched Rustin the other night. Fantastic movie. Uh, I really recommend it. Um, today's Heather Cox Richardson post was about uh, the march um, to Selma and, and the people who were killed and beaten. And um, then I got an email from uh, a list I'm on that's talking about uh, a book called um, The Roots of White Supremacy and how. Uh, so, so there's always there's often in this group a lot of spiritual perspective and by that i mean getting up above things to see that we're all one and it's a lovely perspective to see that we're all one um but it's ungrounded because we're not all one in the sense of well, there's very very different people out there and if you look at you know what happened to the red people and the black people in this country you see the incredible ugliness of that and while I love to talk about dialogue and bringing people together and finding the places where we're all one, we have to recognize that there are people who absolutely will kill you because they don't like the way you look or the way you sound or the things you believe. And um, in today's Heather Cox Richardson, she talks about, you know, the, the it, it took the shame. It took it took front page news of showing brutal beatings and people who had been just black people who had been been completely destroyed and beaten and 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 mangled on the front pages women and children 
to shame this country into taking action. And Gil likes to point out we're historical beings. We carry this with us. This is not something in the past. This is very much alive in everybody. Um, and so I just think it behooves us to, to bear that in mind when we're talking about um, coming together. There's some really ugly shit out there. And a lot of MAGA Republicans, I don't like to use MAGA Republicans because I, I don't think I don't think that you can actually name somebody as that. You can say there's a there's a, a leaning towards it, but it's not who they are, but it's it's an ideology they lean towards. And some of them absolutely, absolutely will will tear down everything to have their way. They are not interested in a common good. They are not interested in democracy. They are not interested. They're interested in, in being on top and oppressing other people from what I can see. And I don't care us talking about that a lot. Um, and maybe we should, or maybe it's too too fraught a conversation. I don't know. But I'm just reminded of how challenging this is, you know, and to um, to tie this back to something I spoke of in my, in my um, check-in, the opposite of the spiritual perspective, which is rising up above and seeing everything as one, is is soul, which goes down. It's it's associated with water, earth goes to the low places, and it divides into self and other, male and female, heart and whole. And from that perspective, things are not all one, and that creates a, a tension in every single person. And the integration comes in the heart of how do you live with that tension? How do you live with the fact that one part of you sees everything as one, and one part of you sees everything as, as divided? And it's a lifetime's work to try and reconcile that, integrate that in ways that bring about the kind of wholeness and the kind of healing that we so often talk about, but which is very, very challenging. And, and you know, some days I'm pretty much on the, we have a chance. And some days I'm like today, I'm on the, you know, it looks pretty freaking grim and bleak. And I'm seeing Mike Nelson just joined. I'm reminded that a few couple months ago you were like i'm just in this really cranky mood and then things are looking really bad you know and i think you're different now but i'm having that just having that going on so um i just thought i'd throw that in just to be a little bit contrary slow plot slow process of contagion um stacy i think a moment ago when i think when she was saying that you have to sort of separate between the people who are intransigent, intransigent than those who are you can actually connect with was saying a piece of what you were just pointing to ken um, and, uh, uh, Mike, if you want to quickly reply to Ken, then I'm going to go to Kevin and Gil. Yeah, just real quickly. I, I, I joined very late just to announce that I am swinging the other way in the pendulum. We got some very important reports out last week on, uh, U.S. technology leadership, and, uh, that's generated some good discussion, but that's only the the technology side. Um, at the same time, we saw the cable cuts in the uh, Red Sea by the Houthi rebels who closed down 25% of the traffic going from Europe to Asia. And other yeah, bad policies going forward. But the thing that's got everybody here at Carnegie tearing our hair out is this prospect Trump is going to actually possibly be in charge of our foreign policy. And that has me swinging as far I, as I've ever been on the other side. But anyway, thank you for letting me break in. And Ken, thank you for being a little more optimistic. And we'll we'll see where we can get. Love that. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Kevin. <clears throat> yeah, interestingly, I, I don't think about big things like that. Don't worry about them. I don't know. They just don't occur to me. But one thing I've done, uh, going back to what Scott was saying, is I've been going into cafes, getting some coffee, but not you bringing my iPad or any device, just bringing a, a notebook and a pen. And I'm finding it really a good discipline to not, what, I'm, a, I'm a deep iPad person, okay? When it first came out, I got an appointment at 6 a.m. at the Apple store on the first day. I was on the Wow. TV news because I was the only guy there without a facial piercing uh, or a tattoo above the neck. Um, and I'm leaving my iPad behind because I am a master at it. You know, it's just the natural thing to me. And I'm just on the notebook having to think about the gaps between uh, what I'm writing about. We had a phenomenally successful conference. But now I have to think about what's next and what I do in the place where I could live where until I die doing that same thing and so 
it needs a lot of space. And so I'm realizing I don't want to be in a contextual complex digital space. I want to be on a notebook and just writing. So that's what's working for me. And, and I don't know why I don't worry about these big things other people worry about. It's just, it doesn't occur to me. So well, other, a, other people are on other people are on the job, so you don't have to. Right. Yeah. You know, I don't see that there's a lot of need to do all that. I don't think there's, a lot of need to do all that big worrying. I don't think it really helps anybody, but that's it. That's that's my perspective. Well, according to Sapolsky, we have no free will, and it's all just going to play out anyway. So there we go. Let's just be nihilistic about it. Um, Gil. Yeah, I guess I'm. I guess I'm predetermined not to read Sapolsky. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate. Um, the teachings from Scott and Kevin um, very much uh, resonates deeply. Uh, I observe that for me, um, not only does my attention change, but my 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 writing and my voice change if I'm writing this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. Uh, the physiological entrainment of the thinking and writing is really different. So Kevin loved the story. Um, uh, but in the remaining minutes, I want to go back to what Ken said. Um, how to come at this. This is really difficult, complicated territory because we talk about, I mean, several of us have, you know, Stacey, you talked about just like excluding the people who are that way. And Ken, you talked about the people who are that way are going to kill you. And, you know, um, them is us. You know, we are all of us capable of horrors. Um, and we've seen that throughout human history. You know, I mean, Germany was the most was considered the most civilized and advanced country in Europe, and you know, and Nazism and the Holocaust ensued. Um, so I think none of us are very far from this on the one hand. On the other hand, um, damn. Um, You know, what you've raised is something I've raised a bunch of times in our living between worlds calls. There's this, you know, there's this, there's this call to bridge the gap, to find common ground, to find the, you know, we're evolutionarily wired to notice difference. And that's adapt. Uh, and we're also evolutionarily wired to live in wall harmony. And that's adaptive. Um, and, um, you know, whether the Home Depot story or the subway story or my experience with my Trump voter friend, that opportunity to find common ground and bridge the apparent difference and find something powerful is really strong and important. And, you know, if somebody comes into my house to kill my wife, I'm likely to try to kill them first, right? Not sit down and try to find harmony. Um, if some, if, you know, someone's hit by a car and is bleeding on the street, um, you know, someone's going to tourniquet them rather than talk with them about, you know, nutrition or health building or better traffic policy. Um, so um, that's, I don't know, I don't know where to go with that. That's some of how I think about this present moment. There, there are times, there are times, and, you know, and Ken, we've also got your story about a monk who goes upstream and places the pebble. So we live in both of those stories. That's all I got. Thanks, Gil. Uh, Kevin, your hand is up, but I think that's a lag from earlier, unless you wanted to jump in again. If not, then Stacy, please. And then uh, maybe to Ken for a poem. Okay. Yeah, so, so let me clarify that I'm not saying don't speak to the people that aren't like us. I'm talking about when Scott's talking about that bell curve, find the people that are in the center of that to have the conversations with. The other thing is, you know, when Ken talks about from a spiritual point of view and then says we're not one, part of that spiritual view says that that thing we're seeing that we hate is inside of us. That's another way to look at it spiritually. So again, there's not one way to look at it spiritually. So I just want to clarify. Uh, 
Thanks, Stacy. Go ahead, Ken. The Benefits of Ignorance by Hal Surowitz. If ignorance is bliss, Father said, shouldn't you be looking blissful? You should check to see if you have the right kind of ignorance. If you're not getting the benefits that most people get from acting stupid, then you should go back to where you always were, being too smart for your own good. Somebody's got a lot of yeah, uh, distortion sorry, there. A lot, of no a lot of noise coming in. If, if everybody will mute, I'll read it again, if you like. The Benefits of Ignorance by Hal Surowitz. If ignorance is bliss, Father said, shouldn't you be looking more blissful? You should check to see if you have the right kind of ignorance. If you're not getting the benefits that most people get from acting stupid, then you should go back to where you always were, being too smart for your own good. Wait. I grabbed something short because I knew we were over time. So. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's been um, one of my favorites so far. Nice choice, Ken. Thanks, everybody. I will see some of you in a half hour. Um, thank you very much. It's great. Ciao.